thank you very much for uh, all of you coming out tonight. Um, I had a, like a half a glass of wine before, and I was thinking, well, this either help or it'll be disaster. <laughs> it's working on the disaster part, I think. But anyway, um, <laughs> it's nice to see you all. Um, Jennifer thanked so many of the people that I was thinking to thank, um, but I wanted to thank her and uh, uh, Lesha and Shruti uh, for all the work that they've done over the last couple of months, probably even more than that. Um, and th thank them in particular for their enthusiasm for uh, my work and just for the kindness that they extended to me when I came in here. It was, it's such a wonderful place to come into, uh, even with all of you here, but when you're not here, it's such an <laughs> amazing escape <laughs> from the real world. Uh, so I encourage you to come back often, and their spirit makes it really special, I think, so thank you. Um, and I did also, uh, I, I wanted to thank uh, John Wendell, who's, I guess John's not in here. Oh, he's in New York, yes. okay, snowed in, um, for introducing me to uh, Jennifer. And John's been a long time supporter of my work, and um, so it's been great to make contact with him again. And then I was gonna extend my thanks to Akiho as well. She told me, don't you dare. But anyway, <laughs> she has, uh, she supports my work in so many ways. Um, the term ghostwriter takes on a different uh, connotation when a calligrapher says it, but uh, anyway, <laughs> so mostly what I want to do tonight though is uh, shed some light on the character uh, who's missing, uh, that is uh, a David, David Anun. He gets his name pronounced and spelled many different ways, um, and he's used to that. He, he said at one point, um, well, it, he says, if it keeps going, one of these days I'll just be called David anyone. Uh, so <laughs> Anyway, he is quite an interesting character. And I uh, first became aware of David um, in 2004, one day when a, a package arrived in the mail. And in the, it contained two books of poetry, a long poem titled uh, Tabula Gratulatoria, and a letter from a publisher uh, that said these were being sent in gratitude for the inspiration that the poet received from an exhibition of yours in Bruges. And I thought, what an amazing gesture. And then my next thought was, I think he has the wrong person. I don't remember having an exhibition in Bruges. And then I, I noted on the poem it said to Thomas Ingmar in uh, Manna, and I had been in Bruges uh, in 2002 and a small gallery there purchased a number of uh, little works. And so while it wasn't a formal exhibition, they could have been on exhibition. So I decided it was possible. Um, I think, could we turn down some lights? I anyway, I, uh, I subsequently wrote to David and thanked him for uh, the kind gesture for the poem and the books. And he, uh, he responded in a, in a letter with the words, he says, your work at Bruges gave me a great gift. It freed the flow of words after a period of silence. I felt and still feel as if you were showing me new signs and ways of moving through space. So I decided to do a, a book of, uh, to create a book with the poem. And I wanted to use it as an opportunity also to learn more about David and his uh, creative process. So I, uh, I submitted or sent uh, some questions to him, uh, and I included the questions and his responses in the book. Uh, but to the question, one of the questions that I asked was, how do you see your poems as stories uh, or as thoughts or as sounds? And David replied, my poems are increasingly dances, plays of hazarded action in space. So not so much stories, but choreographies uh, of sound and marks on paper. And another one, uh, it's as though my fingers sense which way to fly through words before my mind does. And I, I, 
I kept thinking he's writing about his process of writing poetry, but to me it seemed like it'd be, it could be someone describing making a drawing or how a calligrapher might work. But these spaces then were interspersed among my visual interpretations of, of the poems. So this is uh, Invisible Lucian Nodes. His poem was describing work that he saw in, that, in the exhibition in Bruges. Uh, it was a very long poem, but made up of a lot of short, um, short words and phrases, many of which I had to look up and ask him, what does that word mean? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I also was interested in having him, uh, having his own handwriting in the book, and so I sent him uh, some folded sheets and asked him if he would write out the poem, and then when he returned them, I worked into, the, um, into those pages. And another one, uh, the word seizing. After this, I think for a couple of years we mainly kept in touch with an occasional email and Christmas cards. Uh, so our second collaboration uh, was really more by accident than design. Uh, it was this book titled uh, Seismograph Jitter, and I had been asked by a client to find some, uh, some poetry that would go with some drawings by Oliver Jackson, an artist in the Bay Area artist, and these are some of uh, the drawings. Uh, and I had a, I would say, a brief unsuccessful search for uh, poetry and not finding things that seemed to match. I thought of David, and I asked if he would be interested in writing some poems. So I sent him the drawings, and he wrote a series of poems titled Nine Starts. Um, and this is a book page. I eventually created a book from it, but I love, the, again, the language uh, rhythms in Lines like uh, toe tap, hip sway, head sway, hand blur, shouting out, rageous, thicket, elated, letter birth. Um, and he wrote when, uh, he made a comment when he sent these to me. He said one aspect of, of the writing, and he, was study, he said he was working spontaneously. Uh, he says what was the way the process split words and flung syntax into new shapes. For me, it was also interesting because I, 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 in, in addition to the words, I was found that I uh, was using uh, Jackson's drawings as inspiration for new letter forms. So on the left uh, of the image there is a recreation of one of the, uh, a portion of one of his drawings and then the letter forms that grew out of that. And another image from the book. I. I recall at that time thinking, this was after six years from the first book, um, I wondered if I would ever meet this guy. Would we just go on forever? <laughs> and then a, a really unique opportunity uh, happened in 2010. I was asked to uh, organize uh, or in, uh, to direct a, organize a summer program that was going to be held at Sunderland University in the UK. And at the forefront, they were thinking, well, let's invite someone else to work with you, someone other than another calligrapher. And I thought, ah, David. So uh, I wrote to David and he was, uh, he was quite excited to do it. And so we uh, organized a program that involved him um, running morning sessions for a sort of writing sessions for a, about 100 people. And then there were five teachers, and we broke up into smaller classes for the afternoon. And uh, David and I then taught a class uh, with uh, 20, 20 students. And it was our, the focus of our class was, uh, was looking at the affinities between poetry, calligraphy, and music. And one of the exercises involved the students working around a table, long table, uh, and making marks to some strange music. Um, and David, uh, meanwhile, uh, pinned a piece of paper on the back wall and he wrote a poem that was in response to all three, the movement of the people around the table, the marks that they were making, uh, and to the music. And at the end he explained, uh, explained his poem, talked about the words he was using and why. Uh, and then he also said that he felt like that process of working spontaneously 
uh, to people making marks and to calligraphy, t for him represented a, a really innovative and unexplored area in experimental poetry in the UK. So when we, um, when we returned to our respective studios and countries, we decided that we would uh, sort of pursue something that grew out of that. Uh, my idea was to, uh, first was to make some marks to music and then with words, um, I would create new letter forms inspired by that. So this is just one example here uh, the, the, with the page uh, of marks on the left and then you, have, you may have to work a little bit at it, but it says, ain't nobody king of the street. Um, and then another example, another music page, and uh, Sorling Spring, although someone just pointed out that I misspelled Soaring and Sorling. Um, John Wendell, uh, who one time was selling some of my work that had a mistake in it, I think he called and said, is that really difficult to uh, correct? And I said, well, it, it might be. He said, that's okay, I'll take care of it. He told the client, he says, well, this is how you know it's an Ingmar original. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Anyway, I started by making some uh, music pages, and I would search out as strange a music as I could find, and also a broad range of music. Um, and I used a lot of different tools and a different one by a German industrial band and uh, one called Triptico by an Austrian composer. Okay. There aren't very many of those, so don't worry. <laughs> but I sent David by email uh, some different sheets and asked him if he would, uh, the idea was then he would pick one uh, and send a poem. And I didn't really have any expectations necessarily about what his what the poetry would be like. But I, I always saw my music pages as, I was, I've been, always been interested in modern musical scores, so I sort of saw them as scores for music. But it's, it was quite obvious with this poem that started um, uh, through Valley's Comet Tale that David was looking at it as a picture, uh, which is not really unexpected. But, uh, but given that, then I, uh, I decided, okay, first of all, I don't know what we're doing next. Um, but I'll just follow my original intentions. So the first image on the left was the recreation of my first image with, with letter forms. The middle one, I used some of the marks that were in my original sheet and then introduced letters into it. And then the third one, which actually seemed easier to me, was to make a new drawing. Uh, so I sent them to David and I said, well, why don't you pick one? That, uh, you, that works best for uh, what you want to do next. This is when I learned a great deal about David. Um, I discovered he could be a bit like a poetry writing machine. He wrote a poem for each of them. So we started this back and forth process. Um, and so we ended up with uh, three different series. David wrote, uh, I think, uh, seven or eight different poems. And I did um, at least 15 different sketches. And both of us, th I guess the one thing that we had in common is that we were, we were, he was writing fairly spontaneously and I was trying to keep up with him by working spontaneously. Um, I have to say that some of the works I did though were Sometimes they were things that were in response to a sense of David's poems. Sometimes they were looking back at my original image, but other times they were just out of complete frustration about what is going on here. And so the one image here on the left was one of those. And of course, I send them to David and he says, oh, he says, that's the best one. <laughs> I want it for my library. So that's where it is. Um, but the thing that was curious to me is that um, when we did this back and forth process, I would get an image, or I would make an image that had 
first of all, in the beginning, it was Marx. He would write a poem, and then my next step was to somehow make a new image with the words. But he would look, he would still look at that image as, rather than as something with words, as a new image, and he would send another poem. So then I was faced with, <laughs> well, I have something here that has words, and something here that has words. So it was a little strange. But what I liked about it, um, one is that he was looking at the work I was doing as image, which I think is what most calligraphers in the end desire, is something that you look at more than something you read. Uh, so, so it was both good and bad. <laughs> at that point, we, were, we didn't know if we were at the end, but certainly it was a pause. So there are two books in the, the show uh, titled Out of the Air, which was uh, uh, one of the lines of David's poetry. And this book was a, was a summary uh, where it matched some of my studies with the poem that David had written in response. Um, this just shows a couple of the pages. And then the third, uh, second book, Out of the Air, version two, um, recorded one of our sequences. Uh, I think it was the second sequence. And then David, uh, his way of... Uh, Ending the process was he wrote a quite a long uh, paper that he uh, submitted to a, a poetry blog uh, that described actually described our work from the Tabula book up to this point, and then he also uh, uh, did this glossary of terms related to um, the, the way we were working. I was curious all along. Uh, how, how would other poets respond? So I asked David, do, do you have any friends that you think would be willing to work with me? And he, uh, he sent me names of, of, I think, six persons. Four were from the UK, one was from um, Singapore, and one was from the Philippines. And then I invited three other poets who were living in the United States. And so three of the books in the exhibition are uh, friends of David's. Um, and I didn't work the same uh, with, the, with the group of poets. I did send them images, uh, some of the music making images, and talked a little bit about the work that David and I had done together. But I asked them if they were interested in participating to, if they could select an image and align it with something that they'd already written or if they were interested to write a new, to write a new poem. And six of the poets wrote new poems. Uh, the others chose poems to go with it. But the, uh, this was one poet, uh, Alan Housley from the UK, and he wrote this uh, poem titled uh, White Persimmon. It has five words in it. He described it as a, as a form poem, but also as a um, performance piece. And it was the performance piece that actually inspired the final work that I did. He, uh, his, his discussion was that it would be performed by three anti-choirs, um, and they would read, it's kind of like a round, but they would start at different times. And I had this image, and they were supposed to speak or sing in whispers as if telling a secret that they had seen something rare and wonderful. Um, so I had this uh, idea of the sound building up and dissipating. Um, so I started a book with uh, something on the front. It's in, in gold, but something mysterious. Um, and then an image of writing. This was writing the poem over and over and over again. I think about a three days of writing. I felt very zen at the time <laughs> or something. Uh, and then the, it, uh, it dissipates into silence again. Uh, and at the end, it, you get the, uh, to read the poem. I couldn't resist, sorry. It's not silent. <laughs> So that's, that's as close as you get to watching me write. So. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Christine Kennedy was another one of David's friends, and I thought the way she got to her poem was the most unusual and interesting way. She chose this image, and she ran it through a software program called Abbey Fine Reader, and she asked it to detect English. And she ran the image all four directions, and what came out of it was the, the portion in the middle. It was bits and pieces of typography and typographic marks, and she ran these through Microsoft uh, spell check. And she got a list of words. <laughs> and the only word, she says, that wasn't part of it was the word taiyu, and the taiyu was the precursor to the Japanese geisha. And so her poem is titled, Diva Fall Jive, Mr. Verb Visits the Geisha, or Visits the Taiyu. Um, this, uh, uh, the, the final, uh, actually the, the sketch that goes with this book uh, is actually at the uh, Center for the Book exhibit now. Um, so uh, I did a lot of studies, but uh, Rob chose that one. Um, so this book actually is part of the uh, Rob's collection. Um, but there are two, uh, uh, I wanted to, aside from creating the new letter forms, to extend the idea of the geisha and the connection to Japanese. And at that time, I had met a, uh, a Japanese book artist who made these structures that she called water wheel books. And so this one is the mock-up, which is in the case there. It's quite flexible. And then the final, final book. Uh, the next uh, book by uh, this man, Alan Fisher. I should be careful what I say if you're recording this. Uh, I, don't, I haven't met him, so I'm hoping he has a sense of humor. But I decided he's kind of like the absent-minded professor. Uh, he's a poet and a publisher and a teacher and a performer associated with the British poetry revival. And he's an emeritus professor of art and poetry at Manchester Metropolitan University, and he's exhibited and has work in the Tate. So he's a quite a, he's a quite an amazing character. Um, but he sent a, a poem that was in this form. But it, when I opened it in the uh, computer, I got it. An, it came in a uh, with a note that says this file can't be opened or something. But here's this kind of image. But I thought since it said that, I should find out for sure if this is correct. So I wrote back, sent this image, and I said, is this the right form? Uh, still stands as the shortest response in an email that I ever got. Yes. That's it. Um, so I was a little intimidated to write again because he hadn't sent an image. And I thought, oh boy, do I tell him? So I, I asked, uh, did you choose an image to go with this poem? And he wrote back and said, I didn't realize I was supposed to do that. So one more email. Uh, I said, well, I, that's okay. I, I can work backwards, I think. Can you, can you associate your poem with some kind of music? I didn't hear back. Not for months, I mean. And so I decided, uh, well, that was it. But I think it was six months after. I get an email and it says, can I still, uh, is, can I still participate in your project? <laughs> yes, that would be great. He sends a new poem. No image. <laughs> I said, okay. Uh, so I ask an image. Oh, said I forgot to send. So, so I have another poem with an image this time. And then about a week later, he says, are you still interested in that music uh, for the other poem? So he sent some music. <laughs> and he said, um, well, it's a, little, it's a little weird. He said, um, if you don't like it, um, just assume a motorboat going across the lake, slowly speeding up. This is what he sent. It's uh, about uh, 35 minutes long, lots of silences and scratches, <laughs> so forth. And so I folded up a series of pages, and I just, all the background marks you see in the pages were just my responses to the music. And then I worked his poem into the pages. Uh, and some of the images are represented the sense of the poem that I have. So in the end, interesting process, uh, a book that I really like very much. And uh, since then, we've had other correspondences. And he's, he's now most eager to continue working. So it's really fun. Um, 
So the work of those three and all the other uh, poets uh, ended up culminating in this final, in a final book that was made possible uh, by a commission from Duke Collier. So that's the book that's on display back there. Also the binding and the container back there were done by Eleanor Ramsey. So it was altogether a wonderful uh, uh, collaboration between many people in the end. And for this book, I tried to make some, some connections with all of the poems. I, I kind of wrote a whole story, but I was looking for both visual and verbal uh, connections between the poetry, visual transitions, and so forth. So I'm just going to show a few. These are a few images from the book. The first section, in the first section, all the calligraphy was more expressive, not really legible. I wanted to capture, again, the music and the expression of the page. This is a poem by uh, Jack Hirschman um, called Contradictory Kabbalah Blues. Um, this was another portion of a poem by uh, an English poet Robert Shepard, and it was a poem uh, called Afghanistan. Um, this was a, a, a woman that I've known for many years who's now, I think she's studying for a PhD it's at uh, U you see Santa Cruz, but it's a, she's a Tibetan poet, and it's a philosophical poem. Her name is uh, Serene Wangmo, and it starts with the lines, Rain was our sorrow when it came. Sort of made me think of our days. <laughs> and uh, another poem titled Origami by uh, uh, Marjorie Ivasco from the Philippines. The uh, second section of the book then included uh, more formal calligraphy. A couple of pages described my process of working with the poets. And then for each of the poems, uh, I recreated the image that they chose along with their poem written formally. And then in the last section of the book, um, the brief biographies of the poets. This was in 2013, so it's only been it hasn't been that long, but the period since 2013 has actually been the most productive period uh, for David and I. We've completed uh, eight unique books, three edition printings, and this wall piece that uh, uh, is behind me here. Uh, and some of the books still continued with this idea of um, mark making response to music. Uh, this, the Shiva. Shiva, a liquid club. David describes it as one of his uh, darker, edgier poems. But the setting is the atmosphere of, a, of the typical English uh, European or European liquid clubs. Lots of drinking, dancing, and loud conversation. Uh, and I wanted my pages to capture that image of sound. Um, I included this, this spread is in the book, was my response to two of the popular uh, uh, electro swing selections of music that one might hear in the club. And then, again, David's, uh, David's poem extending that visual chaos. Another one included music, but in a much different way. David asked me if I had any images that were incomplete. Uh, his idea being, well, if I sent them, he would, he could write a poem, or he would write something that would then re-engage me with the image to complete them. Um, so I sent him, I actually had some pages folded up that had been laying around the studio for quite a while. So I sent him images. He wrote a poem, but he also has a friend who had been, who's a composer, John uh, Cowley is his name, uh, who wanted to do something that was in response to the calligraphy as well. So he, uh, I had both David's poem and then uh, John's music, and I'll see if this will work. But he sent two short clips, and I started a new page, and these were my first responses to what you're listening to. And then in, in that, I incorporated some of the David's poem. And then I worked back into some of my pages, uh, Similarly, with uh, using one of his other uh, clips or compositions, and work that into my image again, along with some of 
uh, David's poetry. And then I went back and did another uh, new page that was my response to the music and David's words as a new calligraphic image. Uh, just a few more books. Uh, two of them allowed me to explore uh, a latent passion for forgery. I thought if I can't make it as a calligrapher, there's always something more devious. Um, so this book was uh, uh, David's poem. It's exploring the, uh, he's looking at a, an image of Mary Shelley's writing of Frankenstein. And he explores the, what he thinks of as conflicting emotions suggested by her scratch outs and additions. And for me, the project involved uh, the exploration between a recreation of her handwriting and then uh, some expressive uh, interpretation of the Frankenstein uh, poem. Uh, in the book, uh, this, I've in, I'm including uh, some of my sketches. One of the things I found, actually Mary Shelley's handwriting was pretty terrible. And now it's mine, because <laughs> I did a lot of practice learning, and it was quite fun to, to, to do. Um, but I decided to include these uh, in the book, all my different sketches, uh, hoping that, that there's not a future David out there who tries to make speculation about my additions and corrections or something. So, um, Against the Odds is another. Uh, there are two books here. Um, so there are two versions. But it was not so much a, a forgery, but a recreation of a small papyrus fragment that is believed to be the uh, oldest writing of New Testament. And the, the, the fragment is only two by three inches. Um, and David, in his poem, he's, he's wondering, first of all, and the reason he called the poem without odds is how, or, or against the odds, how does something like this survive all these years? And why does it survive? And is there a message for us? Um, for me, uh, I was interested in the, all the different writings. There was the copy of the original Greek. There's also the part that's missing that scholars have uh, interpreted from the page. And then there's the translation uh, into different languages, but then English, uh, that, was, that would have been part of the uh, existing fragment, and of course then the missing part. So for me it involved um, like four or five different kinds of writing, so it was fun to try to put these together. Um, David, though, when he wrote to me, he said, well, what is the meaning? I mean, is there one? And so he, one thing he wrote in an email, he said, it's as though we're at a doorway, humans poised at a door where everything, all the hate, death wish stuff can still turn back. It speaks to me about human interaction and finding ways away from violence if we don't listen to the crowd. Uh, and this was the other part that he wrote and I made it the preface of the book, but I thought it was such a powerful statement. Um, there is a moment in all human interaction, a haunting and liminal moment where we can turn away from hatred and hard words. We get to choose how to use that short space. And that last line, we get to choose, is, I thought was really powerful. It's one of the books, maybe the only book here, where you probably noticed everything is legible. <laughs> I just, I, I, you know, mostly I'm looking for things where I can really play, but somehow the, the words are so powerful and I felt like that had to be the focus. This is the very last uh, book that we did. Um, and again, music plays a part, but in, a, in a, a way that started this time with David writing three poems that were in response to three existing pieces of music by John Zorn. 
And I think rather than saying anything about the book, I will just end. This is a short, the first image of a short video clip that includes um, Zorn's music and David's voice. So he will get this evening's last sound or last word. This is three from the Zone Suite. Kiss Me, a tribute to John Zone's Shia Hashirim. A far cry rising so closely inside, a keen, garnered, inmost, the very quick to the furthest tip, belled to embodiment, sweetness, seared, streaked nights now. Splays fingered sound, subsonic to radial, arcs of fire spa engagements, deliquesce trembling points in the diamond reconciled. Haiti from Filmworks 10 in the mirror of Maya Darren. Acoustic striation, storm horde of the coast, upon us shadow auroras threaten the mosaic, crossroads of solo niento, coming through masks peeling into Floribunda, as a storm's entrance before and after, instilling dividedness and wonder each surge licking multitudinous particles, all we are, day stars in the patterning. Apocryphon from Transmigration of the Magus, restless weavers and unweavers of the hidden nest, mind, quanta and consciousness, tones that glow and tremble in space, remembering the matrix.